All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the virtual tour of the of the Shingwok Residential School site. Uh, thank everybody joining today, either in person in the fishbowl or via Zoom or um, via YouTube live stream. So thank you all so much for coming out today. Uh, my name is Maddie Buffano, and I'm the Community Access Assistant with the Shinwalk Residential School Center. So I do a lot of the educational programming, a lot of educational outreach, and virtual tours like the one we're about to show you today. Um, it's important to note that I am speaking from a settler perspective. Um, my family is pretty recent to Canada as of the 1950s. So the perspective that I will give is obviously not the same as the perspective of an Indigenous person or even that of a survivor. It's also important to note that no two residential school experiences are exactly the same. Um, even people who attended at the same time uh, at the same school may have had different experiences and different stories to tell. So what we're going to go through today via the virtual tour is basically what you would have done um, if you were here in person with us. Uh, we did an in-person tour this morning and I'm really glad everybody's joining us for the virtual aspect. So it'll click us through the site and we will get underway. So what we're about to do, this virtual tour was developed at the beginning, beginning in 2019 and it's still currently in a beta development mode. So if there's any little glitches or anything, I do apologize. They will be fixed when the final version is released. So without further ado, we will get underway. So there we go. So where we are in front of now is the actually the second iteration of Shinwa Call on the property. The first version was down on the lawn area. I will talk more about that when we move there. But this version was constructed in completed in 1935, construction beginning in 1934, and it follows a general plan um, that a lot of residential schools look followed. Sorry. Um, so you may notice that if you've seen images of other residential schools across the country, it looks pretty similar to those. It's because they were all designed by the chief architect for the Department of Indian Affairs to kind of look similar and more institutional, keep it all uniform. So Shingwok itself is kind of eight shaped. There are some that were T or cross shaped, um, but this is the version that we have here. So Shinglock operated from 1873 all the way up to 1970, so nearly 100 years of operation. Um, and it was an Anglican-run residential school. Some of the other schools uh, across the country were run were either Catholic, Methodist, Lutheran. There are even some Mennonite and Salvation Army schools um, across the country. There are also some secular ones as well, but the majority were Catholic and Anglican. Um, Shinglock itself was divided almost completely by gender. So um, basically right down the middle. So this side over here would have been the girl's side underneath this peak and this side would have been the boy's side. There was a girl's stairwell and a boy's stairwell. Those were also kept separate and separate doors on the back of the building. I'm going to move us up closer to the front door here with my many clicks. So to draw our attention to these doors here, these are actually the original doors from this building. So you can see the hardware has obviously been replaced in a lot of spots, but uh, for the most part, these are the original doors. Um, we work very closely with the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association or CSA, as I'm gonna to refer to them from here on out. Um, and the survivors involved in that organization basically said that they, we need to keep these doors as long as we possibly can. Because the moment they walk through these doors is the moment their lives changed forever. Students did not use these doors typically. Um, they would have used them upon their arrival at residential school and then uh, that was about it. They would have had to use the separate doors at the back of the school, uh, again, gendered girls and boys. Uh, these doors were mainly for staff, visitors and clergy members. Moving away from here, I will take us down to the lawn, slowly. So just to give everybody some bearings of where we are. So here is Chinua Hall. So we are just right here. So you can see that there's two monuments here. So this very first one was erected by CSA in 2012. It features the seven grandfather teachings in both uh, English and Ojibwe. And it's dedicated to everybody across Turtle Island or North America who attended residential school, whether they came home or not. Um, so it is also 
facing the school, which you might have noticed. So this is done intentionally as a way to say that we are still here, we are still strong, uh, resilient, and what you tried to do was not successful. So it's a way of making a statement to the school itself. Um, the older monument back here, which I will show right here, um, is actually dedicated to the first principal and the founder of the Shinwalk Residential School, Reverend E.F. Wilson. So Wilson himself came from England and eventually completed his missionary training at Huron College in London, Ontario, eventually moving up along the shores of Lake Huron and settling in Sault Ste. Marie. So his vision was to form uh, the Shinwalk Industrial School. So he built the first school on this site as well as the first school in Garden River. That school only existed for about six days before it completely burned to the ground. So Wilson regrouped and then eventually settled on this site for Shinwalk. Um, it was chosen mostly due to its proximity to the river. He was paranoid of another fire. So having the water close by would have helped ease his mind that they would be able to put out of any fire if it were to happen again. And it was also important because the majority of the students in that time period were coming to Shinwalk by boat. Um, so at the time, the water was actually much closer than it is now, it was probably up to about where Queen Street is, if you're familiar with Sault Ste. Marie. Um, so you can see that that might have been a determining factor in choosing this site. Um, so the original school was actually around where the monument is here on the lawn, would have went over to about the driveway, and in and around that area would have been Market Garden. So Shinwalk itself was a working farm and it operated on a half day system. Students would spend half the day working somewhere around the school and the other half of the day in class. So uh, the farm work, uh, especially in the earlier years would have been mainly to sustain the school. So they would have grown things like cabbage, potatoes, uh, just market garden vegetables in order to uh, feed the students and feed the staff. They might've also sold some for profit uh, to help generate revenue for the school. Uh, they also had much larger crops in the back. The whole Shingwalk site was about 90.5 acres with 60.5 of those being farmland. So as you can imagine, that's a pretty massive plot of land to have uh, being worked. Uh, from here, I'm going to take us to the uh, Shingwalk Chapel. So we are at the exterior of the Shinglock Chapel or the Bishop Foke Memorial Chapel. Bishop Foke um, naming being the first uh, Anglican Bishop of uh, the Diocese of Algoma. So Wilson named the chapel after him. Um, students, because Wilson was an Anglican, Anglican minister, he would obviously would like his students to attend services. So he would, at the time of building Shinglock, Sault Ste. Marie was pretty a ways away. Um, so Shingwalk was actually outside the boundaries of Sault Ste. Marie. So he would have his students go into town every every Sunday, at least to attend a service. And eventually that just kind of became too much for him and too much for the students. It was taking up a lot of time. So they opted to build a chapel on the site. Now the chapel itself, uh, Wilson designed it and then hired one adult general contractor to oversee the building and the remainder was done almost entirely by students. So um, any of the mason work you see, a lot of the woodworking done inside, that was done by students. Um, and the only things not done on site were the stained glass and the original pipe organ. Those were both shipped in from England. So we'll go into the chapel now. As you can see, uh, there's quite a bit of intricate woodworking done in here. All of the pews, um, the ceiling, the archway up here as well. Um, we'll turn around, we'll look here. Now to speak about the chapel itself, it kind of remains a bit of a conflicted space amongst survivors. So um, some survivors have more positive ties with the area, especially if they were already um, practicing Anglicans or practicing Christians when they came to residential school, especially in the later years. So these students might have felt a connection to their faith and to their home uh, in the chapel. So it would have been a lot more of a positive experience for them. But on the flip side of that, there are some students who would have had 
really negative experiences with the chapel just because it speaks to them as stripping them of their way of life, stripping them of their culture, their home and their experiences. So they're just, it's really important to note that no two uh, survivor experiences are exactly the same and the chapel's a really good example of that. Um, looking around the chapel, you can kind of see uh, some more of the work that went into it. Uh, students would be in the chapel at least once a week. It really depended on who the principal was at the time. Sometimes it could be more, uh, especially during uh, like holiday seasons like Christmas or Easter when you're typically attending services more. So it really just depended on the time of year and who uh, was in charge of the school at the time. Um, so we'll go back out through the chapel and we'll actually take a look at the principal's residence now. So looking at the principal's residence, it kind of has a familiar look uh, to Shinghua Hall over there. This is because they were built at the same time, both in 1935, and the principal would stay here with his family, so with his wife and kids. Uh, the principal's children typically didn't attend classes with uh, the students at the residential school. They might be taught at home. They might be, um, pardon me, they might have been taught uh, at schools further out in the community that were for settler children as opposed to the residential school. So they wouldn't have typically uh, been in the classroom with children at the residential school. More recently, this building was the home of Shinghua Kinema Gagmig or SKG, um, Algum University's Indigenous Partner University. They're in charge of the cultural learning, the land base and the language learning that happens on campus here. So they've actually moved to this building over here that you can't really see. But while they were in this space, they did things like uh, beadwork nights or Anishinaabe Moan Pictionary, some really, really awesome uh, cultural and language reclamation activities that happened in this space. So it's a really good reuse of the space and a really good reclamation of the space. Um, it's currently the offices of the Shingwok Education Trust who hold the land that Algoma is on in Trust for Indigenous Education. Uh, from the principal's residence, I feel like I'm flying through this and I apologize. Um, it's, yeah, but it's, sorry. <laughs> um, we're at the Shingwok Cemetery currently. So the Shingwok Cemetery, um, every residential school had a cemetery. They might not have all had a multi-purpose space, they might not have all had a dedicated chapel, but they all did have a cemetery. So the cemetery itself uh, is actually kind of divided into two parts. There's the older half of the cemetery, which is marked by a stone wall. And then there's the newer half, which is marked by the chain link fence. So I'll actually pull up this picture here. So this image was from around 1900. So you can see the uh, original gate of the cemetery in the stone wall. And this image here is of um, it's of drawing that E.F. Wilson had done of the cemetery during his time here. So you can see what it looked like while he was here in the 1800s. Um, moving into the cemetery. So we have about 109 recorded burials within the Shingwok Cemetery, 72 of those belonging to students. And obviously looking around, you're not seeing 109 uh, headstones. So this is because the majority of the student graves were marked with wooden crosses. Um, and just due to the nature of wood and vandalism over the years, none of these crosses remain today. Um, most of the headstone markers you're going to see belong to staff or clergy members. There are a few marked student graves, um, especially in the lower half of the cemetery. A lot of these would have come from when students were being sponsored by Sunday schools or churches back home to attend Shingwok, and they would have come here and been, um, had their had their uh, burial sponsored by those groups as well. Um, to speak about student death at Shingwok, so of those 72 recorded burials, a lot of those could be attributed, attributed to um, illness. Um, so students at Shingwok were sleeping in single dormitory style beds about a foot and a half apart. And at any given time, there could be 20 to 30 to 40 students sleeping in one room. Um, this 
combined with uh, usually a poor diet and already weakened immune system made things like tuberculosis or influenza run absolutely rampant through a lot of residential schools. Um, Shingwok was no exception. So pretty much if somebody got sick, almost everybody got sick. And unfortunately, some of these students just would never recover. Um, there was also records of farming accidents and drownings. It's important to note that these are just the recorded causes of death, and this might not be all of the causes of death that happened here, just depending on how it was reported to the, um, reported to the government. Um, again, when a student might have passed in the middle of a quarter, uh, funding was given to residential schools by how many students they had at the time. So school might not report the death um, to the government or even to the family until the end of the quarter once they had received a new student in order to take the place of that so they wouldn't lose out on any funding. Uh, sometimes parents would be waiting for their children to come home at the end of the year and that would be how they'd find out that their child had passed away. Um, so it's just was a cruel system by design and it often led to parents not having the closure or even family members having the closure of what happened to their children and where they might be buried. Um, I'm going to draw our attention here to this stone cairn. So during the 1981 Shingwok reunion, so this happened about 10 years after Shingwok closed in 1970, and it was a gathering of former staff, students, and their family members who came to come together and talk about their experience at Shingwok, experience at residential school. Um, when they came to the cemetery, they had seen that it had fallen into disrepair over the years. Um, and on that day, they had pledged that the cemetery should be respected and well taken care of. So after some fundraising in 1988, this stone cairn was uh, installed and dedicated, and it's dedicated to everybody who's buried within the cemetery, whether they're staff, whether they're students, whether their graves are marked or not. So this image here is from May 1988. So you can see it in all of its 1980s glory of the dedication ceremony of the cairn. Um, so it's just to make sure that everybody who is buried within the cemetery is memorialized in some way. Um, so moving out of the cemetery and into the farmland. So if you're again familiar with Sault Ste. Marie, you'll recognize this as Anne McCray Public School. Um, and then back here is back of Ogilvy University's campus and you can see the spire from Shingwak Hall off in the distance. So this area here um, would have been mostly farmland. So like I said earlier, Shingwak was a working farm. And if you can think of a farm animal, it was probably here, cows, uh, goats, pigs, chickens, the whole shebang. Um, so I, when students were spending, spending their days working, they would have been in charge of the animals, would have been um, working with the teacher who was in charge of farming in order to make sure the crops were planted, irrigated, tending to things like that, picking stones, um, just classic farming tasks. Um, while students were learning farming, they were also learning some other trades, especially in the earlier years, like carpentry, woodworking. Um, during the industrial school era, so while Wilson was principal, there was a tinsmithing, a boot making shop, even a print shop on the site. So students were learning uh, trades that would have benefited them in a settler society as opposed to benefiting them for their lives at home. So while they could be, it could be that they're learning something new that would benefit them, a lot of the times it just didn't apply to the situation that they were in. Um, an example I like to use is uh, Mike Kakaji, who's one of the survivors we work pretty close with. He's actually behind me here in poster format, but he often talks about how he was taught how to milk a cow. Um, where Mike is from, there's really no suitable area to keep cows. So it's just, it's not a skill he would have ever used outside of residential school. And as he says, it's something he's never had to do ever again. Um, so from the farmland, I'm going to take us to the back of Shingwak Hall. So like I mentioned before, there was a separate girls door and a separate boys door. So this is the girls door here. Um, and this is actually the exterior of the Shingwok Auditorium. This is also the girls' yard, so when they would have had any free time, uh, this is where they would have been, their outside time. 
And a lot of the female students work actually happened right here. So this is where the kitchen and the laundry would have been. So they would have been working here, whereas the boys would have tend to have been more chopping wood, doing more of the manual physical labor uh, work. Um, so I'm gonna take us into the girls door. So we're on the main floor of Shenwalk Hall now. And I'm going to draw our attention to the cubby hole space here and I'll zoom in real quick. So this little crawl space under the stairs, it's not, it's not very big. It's probably like two and a half ish feet wide, four and a half ish feet back. It just goes underneath the landing of the stairs. But um, we have a banner here now featuring Marjorie Lee who tells her story in relation to the cubby hole. But basically students had found this space and they had used it as a space for to be alone, to be away from the staff, maybe to be away from the 30 other kids they were sharing a room with a space to speak their own language and be safe. Uh, but when staff found out that this is what they were using it for, they had flipped it into a punishment space. So if a student was caught maybe running away or um, speaking their speaking language other than English, uh, just anything that they deemed a punishable offense, the student could be placed in the crawl space here and closed in and left there for anywhere from an hour to a to a full school day, just depending on how severe they deemed the punishment needed to be. Um, there was an identical crawl space like this over on the boys' stairs that no longer exists today, but we are preserving this one because it really speaks to uh, any of the pain and the trauma that was induced by residential schools and the residential school experience. Um, and it's a really important and poignant space to be in and to remember what happened here. Um, from here, I'm going to take us up into the Reclaiming Shingwalk Hall exhibition. So Reclaiming Shingwalk Hall, um, this exhibition uh, began kind of as in the works in 2012 and this phase here was completed in 2018. So it is a museum quality exhibition that tells about the history of the site and the history of residential school and uh, a lot of the survivors that we work with. So I'm gonna click my way through to get to the middle here and we'll go back this way. But you can see those are the doors that were pointed out at the very beginning of the tour. This is an artist's rendition of a Thunderbird. Um, it's kind of meant to guide you both spiritually and physically through the exhibition. Um, it also has some of some words kind of uh, cementing Algoma University's commitment to reconciliation and indigenous education and also its commitment to Shingwak's vision. So the Shingwok Residential School is actually named after Chief Shingwok, uh, who's famous for walking to Toronto, snowshoeing to Toronto and asking the government for a school on Garden River. Um, obviously his vision of the teaching wigwam where settlers would learn from the indigenous people and indigenous people would learn from the settlers, that obviously got twisted um, over time and it became part of the residential school system. So Algoma University is committed to upholding Shingwok's vision of cross-cultural education and cultural and land-based learning, um, making, making that vision a reality. Um, this space here, I'll go to the kind of the beginning over here. A lot of clicks, I'm sorry. Um, so this space here kind of focuses on the industrial school era, so the very early years of Shingwok. Um, it talks about the Shingwok home and the Wawanosh home, which was the girls equivalent. Um, eventually the Wawanosh home was amalgamated into the Shingwok home to keep them on the same site, but it did exist um, on what is now the Royal Canadian Legion site at the corner of Wawanosh and Great Northern Road. Uh, there's a little monument there as well. But it has the whole exhibit has uh, portraits of survivors. So if you were in our last session, that's Susie, that's Jay's mom, who we spoke very lovingly about. Uh, we also have uh, replica tin type photographs of some of the very first students of Shingwok. Uh, so these are pictures of the students in uh, uniform, and it also features write ups about them underneath, written by E.F. Wilson. Uh, speaking of Wilson, that is him with the Rasputin-esque beard down here, uh, surrounded by some of his children and some of the children attending the residential school at the time of the photograph. Um, I'm also going to point out this picture here. So this is where we are right now in Shingwak Hall, and this is actually um, the first Shingwak home on the site. 
So they, this is a cool picture of them existing at the same time, just before this one was torn down and this one was opened um, in the 1930s. So that's a pretty neat image there. Um, this is some of the classroom space. You can see the female students working with sewing, um, a lesson space, some more tent type photographs and portraits of students. Um, kind of the transition into uh, from the industrial home to the residential school. So you see some student activities. There were sports at residential school. So there was hockey, track, uh, Shingwok had a judo club for a little while, basketball. Um, but sports were something that could be used as either a reward or a punishment. Uh, so if students were acting, what they acting inappropriately, whatever they considered inappropriate at the time, uh, they could be punished by not being allowed to play on the sports team. Um, and if the sports team was doing well, uh, players might receive more or better food at meal times. And then if the team wasn't doing well, they might withhold food from them. It's pretty common practice at a lot of residential schools. Um, this here is kind of more talking about how farming life at Chingwalk and how uh, what began as just modest buildings and then blossomed into what we know Chingwalk is today. This section talks more about children of Shingwalk and how children of Shingwalk Alumni Association. Um, here with one more click, will bring us into the segment on the residential school era. So from 1935 until the closure of the school. Um, this here is a book that holds um, what the students day to day life and their schedule would be. Um, it's kind of hard to tell in the virtual tour. Again, this is something if you have the chance to view in person, it's 10 times better. Um, but the virtual tour also serves a purpose, so it's great. Um, but it has the student schedule and you can see when you're going through it that pretty much everything is laid out to the 15 minute mark and it's all dictated by a bell. So upon leaving residential school at 16, students who'd had their whole life and their whole days planned out for them pretty much down to the minute, uh, where basically just handed a bus ticket home and told good luck in a lot of uh, scenarios. So they would have to learn how to self-regulate, learn time management. And for the first time um, in their very young lives, they would have to learn how to make decisions for themselves when everything had been planned out for them. So it led to a really difficult transition into life outside of residential school in a lot of cases. Um, and even the sound of a bell could be triggering to trauma in the case of some survivors. Um, you can see here some more work being done. So these students are doing woodworking. This would have been a confirmation class. Um, you can see some more student life. So later classrooms, later dormitories, and then the integration era. So the integration era from the 1950s to the 1970s, the Canadian government wanted uh, to start phasing out residential schools. Students would still live and work at the residential school, but they would attend school in the communities. So Shingwok had Sir James Dunn and uh, Anne McRae Public School built in very close proximity, but students from Shingwok are also noted to have attended Sioux Collegiate or Queen Elizabeth Public School. So students were in classes with uh, children from around the surrounding community. Uh, but they would still be required to go home to the residential school at the end of the day. I'm going to click us back over here. Uh, so this hallway here is kind of a timeline of the site and a timeline of the area. So it starts in the 1920s, so the vision of 1820s, sorry, of the vision of the teaching wigwam um, and how to provide the education for everybody involved. Um, following through to the 1830s, um, some of the missionary work that was done here, some of the work that was done on the land. So it really tells the story of the area and of the relationship between the local indigenous community and the settler community. This panel here um, shows a map of the Shingwok site. So there's actually a cool little floor plan in the tour here once it loads. So this is a digital version of it. So it shows what the site would have looked like while Wilson was around. Um, so it has, you know, the chapel and everything, baseball grounds, showing more of what I talked about earlier on in the tour, which is pretty cool. 
Um, so it goes fully until the closure of the residential school, kind of talking about the history of that there. And this space also leads into the vestibule space. So this is one of the more recent additions to the Reclaiming Chinwak Hall project. Um, so it features more of what life was like inside the schools, what the day-to-day -day life of students would be. So this portion right here is kind of a replica classroom uh, involving both the mission schools and regular schools. So you can see the, the desk and the inside of the building. Um, this window here, like I had mentioned previously, there was a print shop on site. So this is a replica print shop window. We'll click over here. So you can see that there's some of the prints that were actually done on site in the background, and we actually have um, some of the printing press plates that were used. So this one's made of wood and copper, but it is actually one of the ones that's used in the background over here. I'll zoom in in a second, but this was one that would have been used on site, and this is actually it right up here in that corner, which is pretty cool. Um, these publications in the background are mostly ones that E.F. Wilson himself ran. He would sell subscriptions to them to help fund the school and other activities and keep people updated on students they may have been sponsoring at the school. So it was just a, it was a, it was a newsletter that went out every so often. Um, you can see more examples of uh, work that was done around. So you see the farming here. Uh, the woodworking and the carpentry section, so things that the male students might have done more often. And this section with the uh, sewing machine and the hanging, so again, more of the female students' work, laundry, sewing, mending. Um, this part over here, this is a really good example of what I was talking about with the students being so close together. So you can see a good example of the dormitory space. This is a bed that was used in a residential school, so it's kind of the standard issue with some quilts made by a local uh, local maker. Um, this focuses more on the kitchen, obviously, with a gravy boat from Shingwok, so it's the kitchen space here. Um, this space kind of is more of the schoolwork and homework kind of section, so how students would be living and working and doing their schoolwork. And this blank section is for um, SKG to put in what they're doing. Um, at the time of photographing, it's not complete, but that's okay. So from here, we're actually going to move into the Shingwak Auditorium, like I mentioned previously. So in a lot of residential schools that followed this plan, this would have been um, like designated as a chapel space. But because Shingwak already had a chapel on site, this ended up being more of a multi-purpose, multi-use space. So things like holiday celebrations, uh, school plays, sometimes gym classes or other activities were held in here. And in the later years, when students were allowed to sit with their siblings or their family for about 30 minutes a month, this is where that would have happened as well. Um, now, it may seem kind of kind that students were allowed to talk with their families and sit with their families, but be because they had been in the residential school system so long, kept separate from them, and they hadn't grown up with that regular sibling relationship you might have in your home, uh, they almost was like talking to a stranger in a lot of cases. Um, students might not have actually recognized this person as their sibling because they'd been apart for so long. So it's another one of those uh, residential school kind of trauma issues that happens here. Um, this space is actually currently under construction. So it's going to be part of the final phase of the Reclaiming Shingwak Hall project. And it's gonna feature exhibition pods that tell kind of the story about settler indigenous relations throughout uh, Canada's history and things like that. So that's gonna be pretty cool when it is complete. And from here, I'm going to take us down to the project of heart. So this is uh, an art installation done by Shirley Horn, who's a former chancellor of Ogham University and um, uh, a former student of the Shinwalk Residential School. So it's kind of tells the story of indigenous people throughout time. Um, the virtual tour actually only shows three sides of it, if I'm correct. So it, it's not fully complete, but again, it's something that's really great to see in person if you have the chance. Um, so it kind of has the four different sides telling the story and it also features the tiles from Project of Heart, 
So Project of Heart was a is a project where a, a classroom might have a survivor come and speak to them either virtually or in person, um, kind of telling their experience through residential school. And then the students would be given little wooden tiles. I usually used to have one right next to me, now I don't. Um, but the tiles would be kind of how they felt from the heart about the residential school experience and what they learned that day. Um, and Shirley incorporated these into the art piece. So that's basically that. And um, actually that's the Shangwok Residential School Center right there. We're not featured on the tour because it's just an office, but that's us and that's where I am right now. But for the most part, that is the virtual tour. So if anybody has any questions, comments, uh, feel free to ask them. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and you can pop them in the chat if you'd like. If not, it's totally okay. I understand that I just dumped a lot of information on everybody in a very short period of time. Um, obviously, the I'm gonna put the center's email in the chat. So if you would like to email us questions you might have later, that's totally okay too. Um, I'm also going to point out that what I talked about can be incredibly upsetting or incredibly triggering to some people. So if that's the case, you can take the time to uh, sit down, maybe talk with somebody you trust to decompress and also practice some self-care in that regard. Just making sure you're taking care of yourself first. It's also okay if you don't have any questions, that's fine too. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't see any raised hands or any questions in the chat. I'll give it a few more minutes just in case people are typing. Mm, okay, well, thank you all so much for listening today. And thank you so much for taking time out of your day to learn and to educate yourself. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I hope you really have a great rest of your day. Um, and I, I've said thank you so many times, but thank you. <laughs>I'm also gonna point out that we do have a couple um, more guest speakers with our next one starting at one. So if that's something that interests you, uh, you can stick around or you can just join us at that time. So thank you everybody.